Hey guys, how's it going? How's everyone doing, huh? Ah! Oh, come on. That's like 6 p.m. cheering. This is 4 p.m. You guys are still caffeinated. One more time. Yeah! All right. This is a new speaker, man. Got to double up. Um, so uh, ne the next presentation is New Fishing Attacks Exploiting OAuth Authori Authorization Flows. Pretty academic there, huh? <laughs> and the uh, speaker's name is Jenka Huang. And I uh, give a big cheer. This is his first DEF CON appearance. Isn't he so mellow? I mean, the dude is so mellow. <laughs> Come on board. All right, thank you. It's good to be in Vegas. Good to see you in person. So being a noob, uh, take it a little bit easy on me. Just laugh in my general directions when I crack my jokes, okay? So here we go. We're going to talk about phishing, but the other half is about OAuth as a protocol, which I think is pretty interesting in terms of uh, exposing opportunities for abuse. So a little bit about me. I'm currently on the threat research team at Netscope, and I've dabbled in some of these areas over the past uh, few years. But uh, you really don't care about me. Let's see what I have to say. Let's see if we can get some interesting things going. So in about, I'm going to give you a little bit of warning here. The pre-recorded version tops out about 45 minutes. But to reward you for being here in person, I had some bonus material. So there's about 60 slides to get through in 45 minutes. So if I amp it up and talk at 1.1x speed, you better listen a little bit faster, right? Wake up. If you want to fall asleep, go to track two, man. All right, this is... <laughs> This is real stuff. Thank you. All right. Let's recap the history of phishing in about one minute, right? I know you guys know that or know of people who know that. So really, back in the 90s, we're basically talking about SMTP. Attackers are faking domains, SSL certs. And the goal is the primary credential, username, and password, right? Nothing new there. But then along the way, probably driven a bit by mobile, we get apps, and that changes the protocol for the fish. So now we start getting smishes over SMS, we've got chat protocols and so on. And then from a perspective of the parties involved, it's easier for the attacker to host things, maybe it's free accounts uh, with the cloud, you get uh, infrastructure. Uh, from the user side, it's harder to detect these because the domain might be obscured, the SSL cert you know, the real estate on a phone, those types of issues. And then with the cloud, um, well, let me talk about the controls. The defensive side has a couple techniques, and this is important to know, whether you're defending or, or red teaming. Uh, there's a lot of link analysis, which includes domains and certs. Um, the, the fishes start to get a little bit more involved. Um, now, now it could be attachments that have scripting in them that, that follow a link. Um, sender reputation in, 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 the, uh, in, in terms of SMTP might be at play. And it's not only on the incoming fish, but once the user clicks, you might try to detect this. There might be some packet inspection, maybe looking at the content to see if form fields with usernames or passwords are being passed, right? So this is what's happening. There's also controls. Assuming the credential is compromised, so MFA turns out to be a pretty effective way to mitigate that, other the, than the fact that it's complicated and not everyone deploys it. Also IP lists and policies, maybe device policies, so that even if you have that credential, you can't use it unless you're on the right device or IP. Right, so that, that's where we are maybe five to ten years ago. And then what happens in 2012 is the popularity of the internet brings OAuth, at least 2.0, as a spec. And then it takes some years to get adopted, but it's pretty prevalent now. And what does that look like? Well, there's this interchange, but basically the goal is not to have applications get your username and password. You're going to, as a user, pretend you're the user, going to have a secure kind of interaction with an identity provider like Google, like Microsoft. They're the ones who see your, your username and password, no one else. But at the end of authenticating and approving whatever the application wanted, uh, you to approve, they get a session token, an OAuth session token, which pretty much allows them to act on your behalf. And so as users, we've seen this many a time. You might be shopping. You get to check out. You want to get to uh, PayPal. PayPal is an OAuth provider. You get diverted to their site. 
And maybe you even see the URL and the cert, and you're like, yeah, this is the real PayPal site. I feel good. Maybe your software validates that. You go ahead and maybe do uh, two-factor authentication. It's all on the up and up. And then you get to, on the right side, finally, what we call a consent screen. In, in terms of PayPal, it's pretty straightforward. Will you approve this transfer of funds to the original site? But we also see it in other contexts. So let's go to an administrator tool. All the cloud infrastructure providers, Google, they have a CLI. It also speaks OAuth. So some of you probably see that today. So I can log into G Cloud as Joe Blogs, and it'll launch a browser. It'll direct me, the user, to Google to authenticate. And I'll go through the same process. In this case, there might be cache credentials. I pick them or I enter them from scratch. MFA, again, might be at play. And I get to a different consent screen. Do you want to allow these three privileges, you the user, for that application, which is the CLI? Notice a few things that are confusing though, right? OAuth, it's confusing. It's confusing for the user. First, you see the blue text. That's the application name, Google Cloud SDK. What the hell is that? What, didn't I just type the CLI? Well, if you're a G Cloud administrator, you know that's the same thing. But if you're a first time user, like, what, what is that? Uh, application identity is really weak or early with OAuth. And that opens up opportunities for phishing because usually you can just pick that name as a developer and that's what shows up in the dialogue. So that's a little foreshadowing, right, as we get into the presentation. But if you go ahead and authenticate and approve as a user, you get back to the application and in the background it's able to get your OAuth session tokens that you just approved. And then it goes on its merry way basically accessing the cloud environment that you approved, right? Okay, not a problem so far if you're with me. For the most part, the payments works. Um, for the most part, this works. And what happened with the phishing evolution? At first, not much. We're talking five, ten years ago. They just had a different kind of login to fake. So, hey, here's Office 365's login. I'm going to fake that. But then there's a little bit of sophistication because we have these APIs. So when you enter your credential, some of the phishing attacks would call an API to check that credential, real Microsoft or Google or whatever API. And based on the outcome, it might provide a better phish. If it's a valid credential, great, I validated it as a phishing, uh, as an attacker, but I'm going to redirect you maybe to the real Microsoft login in this case, give you a little error message maybe, just say, oh, hey, thanks. Uh, it's, it's sort of a stealthy way to make the fish appear more legitimate, right? Because the user's left not with a transient dialogue, which is a, maybe a fake domain, but they're at a real dialogue. But you've validated the credential up front. And if it fails, you might not store it because it's garbage, or you might prompt the user to re enter it. Great. Same controls. We're five years back. Not a lot's changed. So let's start getting into OAuth, right? So here's sort of where things become interesting. First of all, why do we even care about jumping into the protocol itself to look for opportunities to abuse? There's sort of two main reasons that I'll propose. One is the target is no longer the primary credential of the username and password. Why? Well, there's some problems with that. If MFA is implemented, that's not so useful. It's hard to break MFA. But if you get the session token, it's already been blessed. It's post-authentication. Post you can use it and you will never be presented with an MFA challenge. So in a way it bypasses MFA. That's, that's reason number one. Further, session tokens generally have this um, reputation of being temporary. And, and OAuth, it does have a time limit on what is called the access token. It's usually an hour. But they give you a refresh token at the same time which allows you pretty much to indefinitely renew and refresh your access token. So for all you protocol designers out there, this is a yellow flag. When you take something that's temporary and you make it permanent but you call it sort of temporary, it's a bad thing. So as a researcher or someone on the red team side, it's where you start salivating because there's an opportunity to abuse it. So I basically have a permanent credential that has bypassed MFA. The second big reason is Almost by design, OAuth is connecting three parties that are probably distributed on different IP addresses or could be. Identity platform somewhere on the internet, user somewhere, application could be there, could be different. 
And so there's nice REST APIs, which basically means there's opportunities for remote, remote exploit to grab things like tokens. It's by design made to be remotely accessible, right? So these are two reasons why you want to actually form your attack to exploit or abuse soft spots in the protocol as opposed to the old way, which is just go after your username and password. So what happened with phishing? Probably a couple years ago, we first saw something called the illicit consent grants, and it started to take advantage of parts of the protocol. Instead of faking just a fake website, I fake, as an attacker, the application. And what is that? It is a piece of code. It could be a website, it could be a local native app, but it's an OAuth application, so I do have to register it somewhere in an identity system. But basically, my goal is to trick the user into granting wider privileges. They're called scopes. Wider privileges. So basically I'm going to create something like my Google Drive. And yes, I'm going to prompt the user to authorize, maybe rewrite access to everything in Google Drive. Maybe I slip in extra privileges like rewrite access to email or Google Cloud. And I want to trick the user into hitting allow. If they do, I've got them. I'll get the auth access tokens. I'll have bypassed MFA. I'm pretty much free to go. Okay, so that's a few years ago. And what does it look like to the user? They only see a difference in the consent dialogue. I have two different examples. They're not related. They're just different examples. And the enumerated list might just be bigger and longer or more descriptive in terms of wider privileges than they expect. But let's get real. No user reads this type of stuff, right? It's hard enough to get people to look at the padlock in the browser and understand what that means. I do appreciate as a researcher that the second diagram has these steps 1 through 12. That's actually not my doing. That's Microsoft documentation. I appreciate it. All the fields are explained. What's the thumbnail? What's the domain? As a user, I'm horrified. It's that complicated that you need 12 steps to explain your approval. And it just goes to show that the protocol is complicated for everyone. It's complicated for developers, complicated for users, because no one understands this. You're just going to click through it like a EULA. Uh, that's what's going to happen. So at the end of the day, this was an evolution of phishing. The controls are pretty much the same. And you're starting to see the attack side get a little more creative. So now we come to sort of an interesting piece. Um, two years ago, OAuth was extended to add another flow or set of interactions to handle a special case really described as, hey, We've got a limited input device like your smart TV. That's going to be the application. And you, the user, you've got a resource that I want access to. You've got your Netflix streaming subscription. But we all know using that remote control is a pain in the butt. So for usability reasons, we're going to give you a different flow, which looks like this. This is RFC reference. Folks from Google and even Ping's in there and Microsoft. And for you, the user, it just gives you instructions. Go to your smartphone, go to your desktop where you have a real keyboard. Here's a short URL, really easy, type it in, and here's a short code that you enter in addition to your username and password. Once you do that on a different device, your TV is going to magically get stuff, OAuth tokens, and it's going to connect and access Netflix and you'll be all set up. So that's fantastic, right? It looks like that. But the problem is, I have a saying, unusability breeds or is the father of, right, insecurity and lack of security both, right? Probably job security for some of us too, right? But the point is this is a flag. It's a flag for protocol designers, implementers, and researchers. So really neat, underneath the hood, we're going to demonstrate this, but underneath the hood, let me just describe what happens and what's different from the mainstream OAuth flow we've come to know as users. Basically, once you are doing something with that smart TV, in step two, it goes to the identity provider and gets these two codes, user code and device code. The user code it gives to the user, which we saw in the screenshots. Device code is used to retrieve the OAuth tokens. So the ordering is a little bit different and there's a step up front that's different from the mainstream flow. And what's the difference? The app is totally in control of this process. The code to retrieve the tokens doesn't pass through anything, doesn't pass through the user, comes straight from the identity provider. So 
without fully understanding this, this is a warning bell that there's some opportunities for abuse. So I'm going to switch to a demo. Let's see what that really means. Before doing that, I just want to do a shout out to a Dr. Nestori Cinema uh, who has a great blog, O365 blog. If you care about Microsoft stuff, including OAuth, but AD and apps, you should read the stuff. He demonstrated about a year and a half, actually, no, it's about eight months ago, ten months ago, uh, this fish that I'm going to show you. All right. And so let's see if you guys can see that. Okay. It's not projecting here, so I may need to switch out of presentation mode. Give me a second here. Audio visual problems. All right. Go full screen. All right. I'll make it full screen. Where are we at? Full screen right there. Yeah. Shift this out. Full screen. There we go. Good. Take it out of. This is why they don't let new people go very often, right? Jesus. No, really, I know stuff about security. I just can't operate PowerPoint. The hell? No, seriously. The hell? Who do they let in here? All right, we're good, right? I have pre recorded a demo of this attack. All right, you guys can see that. Left side's a victim, all right? It's going to be a browser. Right side's a terminal session of the attacker. So on the left, let's just go through this attack, this device code attack. So they're entering credentials. They're just logging in in the morning to FA into Outlook. Nothing special. Meanwhile, independently on the right side, attacker is going to fish this person. Ed, Ed at Feast Health is on the, the left side. I want to point out that the attacker has not created anything, no fake domain, no fake application, nothing. He's going to run a script. First thing the script's going to do is do a REST API call to Azure, to Microsoft, and grab a user and device code. It's in the output. This is a real call, just dumping, dumping the output. It's going to use the user code to fish the user. And there's also a login URI uh, that's in there. Uh, that is standard, doesn't change, and it's a real Microsoft login for device code. Okay? So this demo script is it's open sourced and it, um, it just sends out a fish email with a template, which we'll see pop into the browser on the left side. All right, Ed, Ed at Feast Health, he's, he's going to get this Outlook email. I just want to pause here for about four seconds, okay? I worked hard at this template, okay? I, I'm not the greatest fisher. That's not my job. Maybe you know someone who's better, but look. All right, this is a product team email, okay? Hey, I can also not operate a video. God, my skills are bad. Okay, let's go back. Come on, come on, pause. Pause. Okay, spacebar works. Look, this is a freebie, right? Who doesn't want a freebie? One terabyte of extra space, 100 megabyte attachment size increase just for you, right? This is a Carnival Barker. Get your free discount right here. All you have to do is go to the real Microsoft login, enter this nice short code, and we'll automatically give you that in your account. You will love us. So what's happening? They enter the code, all right? Let's assume they follow the fish. All right, let's just be aware of what the user sees on the left. Pick an account or enter your credential. We, we already logged into Outlook in the browser, so it, it's got a cache, but it could be a fresh username, password. Then it says, are you trying to sign into Microsoft Office? Where did that come from? It's because I didn't explain what the attacker did. The attacker did not even create an app. It just reused an existing app ID. It's called a client ID. It reused Outlook's client ID. That's nice. So what shows up came from Microsoft's real app. 
their name. What's going to show up in logs, too, is office. Then we're done. Pretty much, they've just, that's all the user sees. Not much different other than the code. So what's happening on the attacker side? They sent the fish and they moved to step two, which is querying, pulling, looping, and just querying Azure and saying, hey, let me know when the user logs in. After they do, give me those OAuth tokens. And so I just logged in. And boom, all this long gibberish, if you can see it, is the OAuth tokens. First thing you see is up top is the scope, the permissions. Where'd that come from? Well, it turns out that's optional. When I executed this as an attacker, I didn't even request permissions. I just said, in Microsoft's version, they give me the default, and that's a crap load. It's a very technical term, a load of crap of permissions. Calendar, email, contacts, read, write. Also includes AD users. Okay? It's all there. You can see access token in there. Once you have access token and refresh token, you've got the keys to the kingdom. The resource I did specify is an attacker. It's the Graph API in Microsoft, which gives me a fair amount of access. Definitely to Office, but more. And I'm going to, as an attacker, just prove that the access token is valid. First, I'm going to have Ed log in on the left into his Azure account. All right? And on the right, I had already used the access token, and I see three users, David, Ed, and Sandra. On the left, I'll check in Azure AD as Ed, and of course, this was live, it's real data. The users are those three that I created in this environment. It doesn't stop there. I can access Ed's email, so three messages show up. The first one, if you can see the title, is actually the fish that Ed received. And of course, if I pop back to Outlook on the left, it's exactly down to the date, right? It's all real data. So, so far, from this fish, I've gotten AD users, I've gotten Outlook, but there's more, right? So one of the things I can do, and this is really subtle, this is the pivot, the door's wide open, to switch from Graph API to almost any other resource. I'm, I'm going after Azure right now, just because I know Azure will exist because that, that has AD in it. So the resource changed. I did a refresh token call, and I said, give me another token, a different token, for Azure management APIs. And Microsoft didn't put up a fight. It just gave it to me. All right? And with that, I can do things like enumerate with Ed's permissions. Turns out Ed, in this case, is a global admin in Azure, so I hit the gold mine. I can do everything. Right, I've got a new access token, I've got the keys to a new kingdom, and I'm going to use that right off, and you'll see, we'll let this play out. I've just enumerated every resource Ed has access to in his subscription in Azure. And just to prove to ourselves, I'll go back to Ed's view on the left, and there's a subscription named Azure Subscription 1, which is exactly what I pulled with the attacker script. If I go to all resources in that subscription, I'll pull up maybe a dozen or so, and I've got things like disks and computes and SSH keys and storage accounts with data. There's one named SAJEH1, um, SA storage account. On that's a container. On that are some files. But basically, no surprise, once I've gotten a certain amount of scope and privilege with a token, I can do anything with it. Now, what, what I didn't pause at, and I'll just explain as we're looking at the data and it, it's, it's syncing up, it's I got a new scope with that. As I switched, as I pivoted to Azure, I also didn't, I, I requested a scope. It was a really low level scope. It was user profile information. What I got back was user impersonation, which in Microsoft's world means I can do everything the user can do within Azure. Uh, it's pretty common, but you can just see how the door opened. Let's step back from it. This was a Microsoft Office fish with a you know, free space offer. I did successfully fish and get access to Outlook and some AD information. Then I pivoted, and then I went to Azure and I've got everything the user can see. And in this case, I got the right user, right? So all told, 
Not only was I being able to be stealthy, I had huge, huge access with this pivot. So let's go back to our slide deck. So what do you think? Yeah? Well, thanks. Thank, thanks for that. I didn't really expect applause. Just wanted to touch base. I just wanted to see how many people in the crowd worked at Microsoft and see what response I would get. And I know what you're thinking. Did someone really get paid to implement that version of OAuth? Yeah, apparently so. But I don't particularly blame Microsoft, even though this is a pretty big exposure. Um, OAuth is complicated. And um, you'll see as we go, you can't keep this stuff straight. I've been looking at it for, for months, and it's complicated. And it's complicated for users and developers. So let's just peek under the hood a little bit and appreciate that complexity. This is the handshake one through six or seven of what happens with that device code flow. Right? Ultimately, step five is important. That's the authentication. Right? And then the real magic happens in step six when they get the OAuth token. But the, the key to all of this working is step two. The, the device or application has full control of generating these codes that allow it to has the user use one of the codes to authenticate, but then the other code, it grabs the token. It's pretty easy, right? It looks like it. And when we turn it into a fish, it just means we don't have the user initiate this. There's no login to set up Netflix. It's just the app, the malicious app or device, runs the show. And I didn't even need a Microsoft account as an attacker, by the way. This is about as stealthy as it gets. And then the pivot happens right after. This is where I just switch from Outlook to Azure, right? And so in summary, what does this tell us about this fish? Some is common to other providers and some are specific to Microsoft. Attacker, no server infrastructure, no website, no fake page. The login page is Microsoft's. No fake app of any kind. I have a, I have a dumb little script that just pulls and grabs tokens on my time. No consent screen to the user. It did say, hey, you logged into Office, but there was no, do you want to give away the kingdom to this, you know, app? No, there was none of that. And worse, there was this default scope in play where I got a lot by default. Let's talk about logging. There is an event logged when the attacker grabs this OAuth token. It shows an IP address, so attacker will have to just obscure the IP address. You know what's not logged? The pivot. When I use the refresh token to go to Azure, it's not logged. And you can imagine that there's a bias that people who implement OAuth think, well, the refresh token, I mean, pretty much it's indefinite. You just have to do it every hour. Why would we log that and take up space? Because you're getting proverbially screwed, that's why, and you want as much information as possible. But that's not logged. And that's where a pivot is really good in this example. What do I mean by that? I could have directly gotten Azure access tokens from the get-go. I could have even done that as Microsoft Outlook. That's a little weird. I could, have, I could have reused the Azure CLI and gotten direct access in step one. But then that would have been logged. If I'm really going after Azure, I should do it in step two because it won't get logged. And at the end of the day, this just makes it tough for the defenders. There are some controls that are probably in place. People may try to block these device URLs. They are unique if you look at the full path. The domain is not unique. They're very commonly used. But that's imperfect because you know what? There are real apps that use device code authentication. I mean, you might block smart TVs, but the Azure CLI can log in using device code. It can log in with browser, but it also supports device code. Detection's difficult because of limited logging, and remediation's imperfect. On the good side, at Microsoft, it, with Microsoft, you can revoke all, you can revoke the refresh token for a user. So if, if you're remediating an incident, and you're on the defensive side, you can do that. But it only takes out the refresh token. The access token, and this is in the documentation, 
says something like, well, we don't do the access token, but it'll expire within the hour. Good luck. The, the heck? Right? So other than all these issues, it's a pretty good secure system, right? It just shows that controls are lagging, right? It's complex protocol. Now there's a practical consideration from the attack side. These user and device codes, once you generate them, last for 15 minutes. So again, uh, security by temporary expiration kind of mentality. Um, you can't just play the numbers game as an attacker. Out of a million, people will still get it in their email inbox and some will respond. You could go to SMS or chat, smish them, much more interactive, people will probably respond better. Um, you could also fall back and create some infrastructure. Instead of phishing with the device code, meaning I pre-generated it and started the clock ticking, I instead can just say, come to this website, get your free, free discount code. You come, press a button, the clock starts ticking, but it's like search ads. Once you're searching, you know, you're ready to do something, so um, now you're ready to get that discount code because I've drawn you in. Trade-offs, but certainly shows that practical considerations shouldn't be a barrier. I could even do a, an image version of a code because um, browser, email clients in general will not load images, but users often will click and load them. That could come to my website as an attacker. I could generate the code then, show it to you, maybe get a better response. Okay. Let's talk about Google. They're big in OAuth, plenty of apps. How's their device code authorization? Well, a lot of similar characteristics. I can spoof or impersonate a Google app. I don't have to build an app. I can do the Google Cloud SDK, the CLI. Where Google's different and it saves them is they limit, they require you to supply a scope. They, they ask, you have to tell them what you're trying to get. Whereas Microsoft, they'll just give you by default a lot. And it's limited. There's like seven scopes. Three have to do with user information like your email address. Two with Google Drive, but it's only data created by the app. And then two are with YouTube. So it's a pretty tight set of permissions you can ask. But you can get back, in this case, the device and user code. I can fish a user, convince them to go enter the code. They'll go through authentication and end up finishing that flow. And what's similar is no consent. So I know what you're thinking now. It's pretty similar. And it might be hard to believe that Google would give up basic user information like name, email address, your picture, without user consent. I mean, that doesn't happen like in the last 10 years. But it did happen. Um, it's footnoted. In some cases, if you ask for other scopes, um, sensitive scopes, you'll get a consent screen. But you can see that it's very implementation dependent, this warning, this consent screen dialogue for the user. And they both share this characteristic. Both vendors do not present it with device code authorization. So anyway, the flow keeps going. This is just a set of curl commands so you can actually see what's happening down low. I can actually grab and get the access token. I can use it. And in this case, I can get user information back. Okay? So in summary, between the two vendors, just focus on the red and green. Those are the main differences. Look, no consent screens in both for, for most of these flows that I'm showing. The difference, the big difference is Microsoft opens the door and gives you a lot of privileges. Google constrains you to a tight seven. The lateral movement is a huge difference. You can pivot with, from Microsoft from one set of APIs to another, no questions asked. And so far, that's extremely hard with Google. But that's just one flow. OAuth has like five. So let's go back to the main flow that we all know and love, authorizing code grant. Let me just show, it's not as obvious as um, the device code and impact, but it still shows the weaknesses in the protocol. So let's just show something that, something that my kids would say is janky, dad. This is really janky if they understand, understood this at all. This is a snippet of the main flow. You don't have to understand all of it, but I want to point out something. When the app redirects the user to go authenticate and they finish, this authorization code 
has to get back to the app from the identity provider. And this is complicated because it's done through a redirect URI and there's many cases. So if the app is public, sitting on a public domain, the identity provider, you'll, you'll pass that as an app, as an app developer, you'll pass that to Google or Microsoft and they will directly communicate with you the authorization code because it's a public app sitting on the internet. However, the app could be behind the firewall sitting on the user's machine, a net firewall. So the redirect URL can also reference a host that's like local host or the loopback address. And how does that get to the app? It goes back through the user's browser as a 302 redirect. This is where it gets janky because you're like, what the heck? There's like multiple protocols at play. One's a sort of proper 302 redirect or maybe some kind of web hook communication. Another one's a redirect through a user, but that could also be a mobile app. And then it goes through those, you know, funny URLs where you have a registered mobile app. Basically what this screams is there's opportunities for abuse because you can intercept that authorization code which gives you the keys to the kingdom. You could attack the browser as an example. Could be an extension, could be cross-site scripting and you might be able to get that authorization code. You can attack the registration on the device. You can attack the local host uh, name lookup. These require endpoint access, sure, but uh, clearly that's not prohibitive in this day and age. But that's not actually what I want to talk about. Highlighted red is yet another form of a redirect URI. OOB stands for out of band. It's a copy paste thing. What the heck does that mean? It means as an app developer, I can request that the authorization code come back to me through the user. Prompt the user to copy and paste in their browser the code. Show them the code. Prompt them to copy and paste into my prompt. Who the hell would do that? A CLI would do that. Why? A CLI, you could be SSHing into a remote environment with no browser, no graphics, and the only way you can get it an authorization code is to copy and paste it. And that's exactly what Google CLI does. And so who cares about this? Because it's an opening, a little opening to abuse because I can intercept that because the user is sitting there with a code in front of them and I can convince them to copy and paste it. So maybe I fall back and create a website and I drive them with a fish there. And this is a website to invite you, all of you important customers to our innovation group. It will be at DEF CON. You'll be able to talk to us, affect our product strategy. All you got to do is log in to prove you're a Google customer and you're going to get a code. Just copy it into our website. Yeah, I have to convince you and I have to get by the domain issues of hosting this. But if I do that and you go through and log in, on the far right you see the very official auth authorization code. And guess what? No one on earth understands what that code means anyway. Does, does anyone really understand what that code is? No. I mean, look at the message. It says copy and paste it. Good luck. You don't know that it's tied to your session tokens which gives you, which are the keys to the kingdom. So if I can convince con the user to do copy and paste into my something I control, I win. I get the social tokens. So what's the point of this? This is not as sexy as the device code exploit, but it does show that a vendor, Google, chose to implement copy-paste. Microsoft did not. It exposes them. And I would not bet against this being exploited. I just would not. What does Azure CLI do? They use device code flow. Google does not, they use this copy and paste. That's how they do their CLI uh, in part. So I can of course take that token and go house and, and, and now I, I have requested full access to the cloud environment so I can literally enumerate everything there. Okay. So how are we doing on time? Oh good. You guys have done a good job of listening fast or at least pretending to. So we have a couple more slides. So I wanted to pause. It's all well and good to see sort of examples, but I thought it might be more useful to think ahead about how we should research things like OAuth and protocols and maybe look ahead, both from definitely a red hat perspective and maybe a blue hat. So when we're analyzing protocols, we're at a much higher level. And I think, as you might think, there's certain focuses you want to look at for soft spots. One is the handshake and protocol. But I think there's two major 
cases that you want to be aware of. One is the sniffing type attacks where you're intercepting traffic man in the middle. So yes, the bad guy, the attacker can get secrets and other things. But the problem is I think there's a heavy bias. I, I say that from reading the protocols. There's a heavy bias thinking all attacks come through that method. What about outright impersonation? What if I take the place of these th one of these three parties, the application user and the identity platform? The user's the victim, but I can take the place of the application wholesale. So I will get all traffic. I'll create some of the traffic. It's harder to pull off, of course, but it's well worth it. And the problem is if people aren't thinking about that, the controls or defensive measures don't protect well against them. Obviously we're after secrets, we're after the tokens, but with OAuth, it's not the tokens that presumes you have the authorization code or the device code. That's really what you're after, right? So you have to understand the protocol to know what really gives you this, the real secret. And at the end of the day, this, not everything is in the spec. Things are optional, things are left to the implementer as we've seen differences. So just testing does the vendor implement the spec reveals a whole bunch of no they didn't or sometimes they added proprietary things. Microsoft proprietarily added this default scope thing. The heck is that? Well, that caused some trouble. Um, Google and other browser vendors. When you log into Google, Gmail, you can open up a tab, type in a generic drive.google.com. Guess what? You're popped into your Google Drive. But you didn't have to re-authenticate or say that you're approving Chrome to get access to Google Drive. They did stuff underneath to make your experience as a user simple. And that, anytime someone goes off the rails, it usually leads to errors or opportunities. Anytime you see optional or deprecated, and there's plenty of those in the spec, big warning sign. Because one, they're usually deprecated because they're insecure, and it usually takes them like years to actually remove them. So you get this big window. And there's a bunch of concerns that are highlighted in the RFCs, and those are great places to start. So remote phishing, as an example, is mentioned in the base RFC. And the problem is it shows their bias because some of the language says something like this. To protect against remote phishing of device code flows, the identity provider platform, Google or Azure, should tell the user in big bold letters, remind them that a device is getting access to whatever you see, you know, being, you're being prompted for. But that already assumes that you have a valid device in the picture. If I'm controlling the device, if I'm the fisher, I can convince you that that's exactly what you should see, right? I, of course you're going to see device language because half the language is wrong and confusing, right? You see Google Cloud SDK when it should be something like a CLI. I can convince you of anything, right? No one even reads today, right? I mean, come on. Really, we got third grade education, right, in the states of reading. So, I mean, this is not going to work, right? But that's what's in the spec, and it just shows how, how bad of an assumption that it is in terms of protecting some of these protocols. And then at the end of the day, anything that's complex and is simplified is ripe for abuse. We definitely want to look where the puck is going in terms of the protocol development. That gives hints. Um, quickly, in terms of stack, uh, some of the research, I think sitting in, in the middle of the SSL traffic was the most useful, using a proxy with SSL decrypt. Some assumptions, you know, that, that you can approve some certs along the way. Outright sniffing has more limited views, but with browser traffic, you can also decrypt that uh, because they'll dump their SSL keys if, if you want them. Um, source code, don't ignore that from a research perspective, and Chromium is out there, open source, which gives a lot of hints of what Google's doing in Chrome. Um, reversing usually isn't needed, but sometimes there's secrets that aren't really secrets because they're in a native app, and you can reverse them and find out things like client secrets and other things. And so I'm going to jump ahead to, this isn't where the puck is going. This is a picture, Aaron Parecki, of Okta. I think he's still at Okta. Had a good blog. But this picture is, represents OAuth as it is today. It's a maze. The blue squares are the different RFC specs that contribute and make up what we use ubiquitously. It's a mess. No one can understand this. Where's it going? Well, in seven short little screen pictures, this is, this is Aaron's doing, not mine. 
Top left is where we were in 2012, four different flows. Along the way, some of them had to be extended more securely with PKCE, which is an extra secret, until we get to the bottom right where Aaron believes in OAuth 2.1 will simplify and remove all those insecure flows. So this just gives hints. All the stuff that's removed are probably more uh, ripe for abuse today. But maybe in the next year we end up with a more simplified OAuth. And you might think that, wow, that gives us hope. No, it doesn't because one of those is device flow and we've seen how bad that can be today. And also don't believe PKCE will stand up. We'll see how it gets implemented. But if I control the app, I can generate any secret. So finally, to conclude, make sure I don't get kicked off and tossed out of here, there are ongoing research areas and all I want to say is that OAuth is so complicated that this list gets pretty long and it's there today and we've, we're just scratching the surface. And I'll call out to, there's a session right before me in track one, if you didn't catch it, um, Matthew Bryant had some great stuff about app scripts in Google and there's some OAuth underneath and it just shows how OAuth can go in a whole different direction and help contribute to other um, vulnerabilities and lead to some pretty big abuse. So in the interest of ending sort of on time, um, that's it. There's some open source code to drive the demo that was in the video but at least makes it clear the whole interchange. Um, you can pick that up in the slides. If you have follow-on questions, there's a session, I believe, at five in the gold room next door. Feel free to approach me, ask questions. Um, my contact information is there. You can find me in a lot of the usual places. Um, and at the end of the day, um, all I have to say about OAuth is, you know, the one big surprise that I, I didn't think I'd say is that I never would have thought all the research I did on OAuth would lead me back to thinking a different security model of hard-coded clients, uh, you know, IDs and secrets was a good idea. Are you listening, Amazon, AWS out there, right? You know, the AWS secret API keys that get uploaded to GitHub and Pastebin? But by comparison, it's at least simple. You understand your exposure with that, which is don't, don't hard-code stuff, put it on external scripts, don't upload it to GitHub. Here, you essentially got a permanent OAuth key that gets abused ultimately in the same way, but the problem is no one understands this. And I guarantee it, in five minutes, you're going to flush this from your brain because your head hurts. My head hurts from spending a lot more time than you. So that's part of the lesson here. There's a lot of opportunities, no matter who you are, but no matter what, this is an area that uh, deserves a lot more uh, research. Thank you.